Our world has faced challenge after challenge over the past few years. During the pandemic, banks fared well and kept supporting people and firms. But now they find themselves in a new world, one of high uncertainty, war, rising prices and interest rate hikes. And this is challenging their resilience. Every year we review our supervisory priorities. So basically the risks and, and challenges that we look at when we're supervising banks over the next three years. We do this because as the world changes, so do our priorities as supervisors. And today we'll be talking about what our focus will be for the next three years. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm joined today by two guests, Supervisory Board Member Shastin Afjochnik and Head of Supervisory Strategy and Risk, Mario Quagliariello. Welcome to the podcast, both of you. It's really nice to have you here in the studio. Thank you for having us here, Katie. Thanks a lot, Katie. Now, setting supervisory priorities is all about making sure that banks stay safe and sound in the current environment and that they're fit to withstand challenges that the future brings. If we have a think about where we are right now, central banks are raising interest rates to tackle high inflation. Now, these higher rates are actually good for banks. I mean, they, it means more profits for them. But at the same time, the economic outlook is worsening. And this can have negative consequences for banks, for example, if their customers are not able to repay their loans. Shastin, let's dive right into the first priority, which is all about ensuring banks are strong in the face of the current economic and, and geopolitical shocks that we're facing. What kind of areas of banks' operations are you going to be looking at in this particular priority? Yeah, thank you for that important question. The first thing I would like to underline is that so far the banking sector as a whole has remained resilient to the large and negative external shocks it has faced in the recent years. It was first the adverse effects with the pandemic had on the economic activity and more recently the fallout from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So while we don't have data for the full year yet, it's probable that 2022 will turn to be a good year for the banking sector overall. I would encourage those listeners who are interested in the finer details of banking performance to take a look at the joint blog post which Mario and I have published about our supervisory priorities. We'll certainly be sure to link to that in the show notes. As you mentioned, the economic outlook has deteriorated significantly in recent months. The Russian war in Ukraine is ongoing, inflation has been on the rise, and central banks have raised their key policy interest rates to fight that. The combination of these factors presents a number of risks to banks, and they need to be ready for their potential materialization in the future. So in the near term, we are looking in particular uh, at how banks manage their credit risk. High inflation, rising interest rates and slowing growth are putting pressure on many actors in the economy, especially people and companies. Banks lend to these actors and one big part of this supervisory priority looks at the risk of loans not being able to be paid back. That's what we call credit risk. Okay, that's what credit risk is all about. So it's the possibility that loans might not be able to be paid back. Exactly. So credit risk isn't a newcomer to our supervisory priorities. We were already focusing on, on credit risk last year, in particular because of the pandemic. The support measures that many countries put in place were, of course, essential for the economy, but they also made it harder for banks to see which loans could turn bad. So that's because the measures kind of artificially supported everyone and, and there it's more difficult. It's a bit of a blurry picture, right, to see which loans are good and which ones m maybe the people actually would have struggled if they hadn't had those support measures. Exactly. You are explaining it very well. So, uh, but now they have to deal with this new world where they are faced with uh, fresh challenges despite having not yet fully recovered from the pandemic. 
Many companies have been exposed to these economic and geopolitical shocks, for example, from higher energy prices or having to pay more for supplies and labor. They may have to allocate a larger share of their income to these things, leaving them with less to pay back loans. This is particularly true for energy intensive sectors most affected by the war, such as agriculture and transport, and those facing higher costs for materials like construction. So what does it mean for banks? I mean, if they have this increasing credit risk, what does it actually mean for them in practice? Yeah, the increase in credit risk has an impact on banks as the quality of the loans or assets on their books because it will go down. Mm. This may mean that they have to hold more capital to cover potential losses. And we have already seen a rise in the number of loans showing an increasing amount of credit risk, also known as non-performing loans. Mario, I'll turn to you now. Now, when it comes to credit risk, what exactly do supervisors look at concretely here? So we know that they're going to be checking that that banks can manage this credit risk. But what does that mean in practice? Okay, thanks. Uh, This is a good question, Uh, Katie. Perhaps let me start saying, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, we need to acknowledge there has been some progress in the banking sector uh, over the past years uh, in terms of credit risk management. Still, our supervisors during this year have found that there are still gaps and some shortcomings to be addressed. Um, And I think our concern is that, especially in light of the deterioration of the macroeconomic conditions, uh, banks should be uh, ready to put uh, forward the right uh, right practices to detect, measure, and then mitigate the credit risk so that they can avoid that loans uh, become a problem for the banks banks themselves. So how exactly do the supervisors do this? Like what things exactly are they going to be looking at? Uh, There are several ways. Uh, I would say that the uh, toolkit of the supervisors is quite uh, quite broad uh, and they can use it uh, for uh, uh, understanding and assessing what banks are doing, uh, for uh, flagging deficiencies when when this is needed, uh, and of course require and enforcing uh, corrective actions. Some issues are systemic, so they involve uh, uh, many banks at the same time in a similar way. So in this case, the typical tool is the thematic reviews in which you can uh, look uh, uh, and compare banks uh, across the board. Uh, and I think this is one of the benefits of being uh, a European supervisor. Now you can look horizontally at the sector, you can compare and contrast the banks uh, and uh, also identify good practices and best practices to disseminate. Because you have more of a bird's eye view over it all. Exactly. You can uh, look horizontally and then deep dive uh, when, this is, uh, when this is needed. Yeah. Uh, We have also the on-site inspections, which is a very powerful tool because the supervisors can go directly in the premises of the banks and look at what banks are doing and the assessment is more direct. Mm -hmm. Then there are also issues which are idiosyncratic in nature. They they involve uh, mostly a few banks uh, and in this case the uh, supervisory teams are following up uh, directly with these uh, specific banks. Mm. Uh, Perhaps if you want I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, for the next round of priorities. One is on the process that banks are following for granting a loan, is what we call uh, loan origination. This is, I mean, again, is a general issue, but uh, we will focus mostly on the uh, housing market, uh, but also the commercial real estate, so the office space. Mm -hmm. And here there are clear guidelines at the European level, and we want to be sure that banks are following these guidelines. And basically the main uh, principle we are following is that banks should be able to assess uh, since the start of the uh, process how uh, credit worthy the counterparty is in order to be sure that the customer is getting the right product with the right price and uh, especially that the borrower will be able to uh, repay their loans is what Kerstin was mentioning uh, uh, earlier. So even before the customer is on their books making sure as soon as they submit that application for the loan. That's exactly the point uh, and this is only this is not only a, a tool for risk management, so for the benefit of the banks, but it's also a safeguard uh, for the uh, customers of the banks, because eventually there is no benefit for them to get a loan they cannot uh, repay at mm-hmm. some point. Um, perhaps another example is more linked to what Kerstin was saying on the impact uh, of the uh, of the let's say, geopolitical risk at large. We will look at the vulnerable sectors. Uh, this is something... Uh, which uh, we have done already in the past and also shows how flexible our toolkit uh, is because we were looking uh, uh, already this year at accommodation, transportation, tourism, so all the sectors hit by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now we are shifting the attention to the sectors which are more 
heavily affected by the war uh, in Ukraine and some issues on the supply chain. So these, uh, for, the, for the following cycle, we look uh, more at the uh, um, companies uh, using a lot of, uh, of energy, mm -hmm. uh, oil, gas and so on, especially manufacturing, mm. uh, but also the energy, energy traders. And in this case, what we uh, do and our supervisors are doing is to look at the uh, exposures, uh, they assess whether banks are able to monitor the evolution of credit risk, and also if they are putting aside enough provisions for dealing uh, uh, with credit risk in case uh, things go wrong. Let's turn now to addressing some more, shall we say, structural weaknesses within the banks themselves. And this is actually another important part of our supervisory priorities, especially as we look beyond the immediate challenges that the economic environment is, is uh, presenting at the moment. First of all, digitalization. She asked him, what are the challenges for banks when it comes to adapting to this ever digital world? So thank you for this important question again. So, I mean, in our supervisory priorities, we highlight that banks need to look beyond the challenges which lie immediately ahead, and they have to keep a medium term horizon in their radar screen. And certainly the efforts to digitalize should be part and parcel of any strategy for banks in that regard. Digitalization presents a real opportunity for banks to better serve their customers' changing needs and use new technology to be more efficient, but it doesn't come without uh, also risks. Mm -hmm. So banks have to put in place digital transformation strategies. Uh, it's not about uh, just about being digital for the sake of uh, uh, being more digital, we expect those strategies to ensure that banks' business models are sustainable also for the future. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing some gaps there and uh, will be looking closely at those in our supervision. We also want banks to tackle the risks that come with using more innovative technologies. As part of their digital transformation, banks rely more and more on technologies and third-party providers for delivering banking services. So more outsourcing also means that banks are reliant on external providers for some of their critical IT services. Mm. So this creates more complexity and means banks are much more interconnected with other players all over the world. And this is, of course, a risk of operational resilience. So, uh, well, we will be publishing details on our expectations in this area, and we will continue the discussions on the uh, strategies that banks are now uh, providing. Okay. Now, Mario, we talked a bit about the risks that come with moving uh, to, to more digital operations, and Sherstin's mentioned um, this higher degree of interconnectivity, interconnectedness that we have. One thing that comes to mind there, for me at least, is cyber attacks. What's the situation like on that front for banks? First, as you, uh, as you mentioned, the cyber attacks uh, uh, have become a major challenge for the, uh, for the banks and for the operational resilience of the banks. And they are more and more difficult to handle, first, because they are getting more complex, uh, and second, because they, they are changing over time. So it's difficult to track what is going on in the market. Uh, and also, they are cross-border by construction. Uh, so far, what we have seen uh, during the pandemic, notwithstanding the acceleration of the digitalization, banks were able to remain resilient, and this is uh, a good, uh, good sign. Uh, and overall, the uh, operational losses uh, uh, remained, uh, remain limited. But of course, uh, the war in, uh, in Ukraine uh, is bringing new challenges. I think uh, one concern uh, uh, which is uh, already, which uh, Kerstin already mentioned is the uh, outsourcing of some of the critical services. Here, what we have seen is uh, that there are an increasing number of activities that banks are outsourcing outside. Uh, and while this is to some extent a natural evolution, uh, uh, given the complexity of the banking business, is also uh, an element requiring uh, uh, that there are in place uh, uh, enough uh, risk controls. At the end of the day, now producing uh, banking products or services is becoming part of a supply chain and mm. you need to be sure that all the links of this chain uh, are uh, equally, equally strong. And while we are direct uh, supervision on some of the links, uh, we don't have on all of them. So it is important also that banks have in place uh, uh, internal controls. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, external providers, some of the infrastructures are also outside the European Union. This, of course, uh, uh, makes them uh, more vulnerable, especially in this kind of geopolitical situation, because they can become, uh, in a way, the victims of some uh, uh, retaliation, especially uh, in response to some of the sanctions, in this case, against uh, against Russia. Sure. Uh, perhaps, if you allow me, the last uh, uh, element I would mention, which is more related to the, let's say, the governance of the banks uh, and the board composition, uh, all this business is becoming more complicated. So mm. it is important that uh, the right expertise is at the right place. So, of course, you need the technical experts at the working level, but it's equally important that at the uh, in the management bodies, there is sufficient expertise for steering the bank in the right direction. That brings me actually nicely on to the next challenge, the next structural challenge that I want to talk about. We have discussed climate change several times on the podcast already, as well as how banks are actually doing in tackling climate risks. And we'll be sure to link to those episodes in the show notes. Justin, one of our priorities in the more medium term is to continue on our path and and to keep on stepping up our efforts in addressing climate change. It's not the first time we included climate change in our supervisory priorities, but we are expecting progress at, shall we say, a much faster pace than normal because, well, it's just so urgent. Can I ask you a blunt question? Um, Have you seen any progress from banks since including climate risk in your supervisory priorities? How are things looking there? Yeah, we, as you say, we have been talking about climate risk for uh, several years now, uh, and we are talking about, I think, first long-term risk, and now we are talking about medium, medium-term mm-hmm. risk. But climate uh, change is very real for all of us. So the extreme weather that we have seen in Europe is increasing the likelihood of severe damage to infrastructure, houses and livelihoods, which of course impact the banks that lend to and do business with those affected. Mm. So the climate transition is also gaining momentum, triggered in part by Russia's war in Ukraine, Um, and the disruption that this has to energy markets. The transition will um, affect banks' exposures to heavy emitting sectors and those whose business models will not be sustainable in the net zero world. So that's like people with very energy intensive uh, operations, but those that emit a lot of fossil fuels and those that really need to change their operations so that we can transition to a net zero world. Exactly, Mm -hmm. exactly. So in the last year in particular, in particular, we have uh, come a long way on climate in our supervision. We have carried out a climate risk stress test in the summer, and we have done a thematic review of uh, how banks are doing in incorporating climate and environmental risks in their operations and strategies. We saw that banks are making progress in incorporating these risks into their business operations and risk management, but there is still a long way to go before they are in line with what we expect as supervisors. Mario, what we, Shesson just said it, what we, there's still a long way to go until banks will be where we want them to be in terms of our supervisory expectations. What exactly will your supervisors be looking at when they go uh, to the banks and, and look specifically at climate change? Well, I mean, as Kerstin said, uh, we have done a lot of work in 2022. So the, uh, in our priorities, we are planning to uh, follow up on uh, what we have done in 2022 and work uh, and build uh, on it. So first of all, we will look at the findings of the stress test uh, and the thematic review. And uh, uh, of course, we will ask uh, banks uh, to fill the gaps we found in this work, especially uh, when it comes to weak processes uh, uh, for assessing the impact of the uh, climate and environmental risks, uh, but also uh, banks' ability to run a proper stress test uh, uh, against uh, uh, climate risk. In our assessment, some banks uh, do have a good uh, vision on how to support their customers uh, in reaping the benefits of a smooth transition, but still uh, struggle to incorporate this vision into the concrete uh, actions. And we will also try to collect and disseminate the good practices because this is part of our uh, job and effort in this in this field. Uh, we are very determined in this activity and expect that by the end of 2024, the banks uh, will be aligned with our expectations on these uh, on these risks. 
Well, thank you both of you for explaining what our supervisors will be looking at over the next uh, three years. It's really interesting. Now, before you go, I do have one last question. We always ask our guests on the podcast for a hot tip linked to the topic we're discussing today. So broadly speaking, keeping banks safe and sound. Have you thought of something to inspire our listeners? Well, perhaps I could give it a try. I always like the movie The Big Short. There is ah, yes. also the book, but the book, I think, is not as good as the movie for <laughs> once. Uh, and I think for me, what is uh, uh, interesting is that there is a group of investors there who understood uh, before anyone else uh, the bubble in the U.S. Uh, uh, housing market. And I think this shows that uh, some risks uh, might be obvious and still uh, go undetected uh, by most. And I think this is why we are making uh, uh, an effort in avoiding uh, blind spots in our assessments. Uh, but it's not easy. So this is for me the let's say the lesson from this uh, from the movie. That's a great hot tip. One of my favorite films. So I'm very very happy with that. Thank you so much. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank Justin Afjoknik and Mario Quagliariello for joining the conversation. Make sure you check out the show notes for additional material on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.